Hello and welcome to the, what is it? The eighth? It's the ninth Understanding Clive. Understanding Clive? Understanding, <laughs> <laughs> Understanding Clive. You know, I was in a band once called Clive Star. Um, that's not a joke. Okay. Uh, Understanding Class live stream. Um, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. This is, we're doing chapter five, Michael Mann's two framework, two frameworks of class analysis. Uh, so we're just starting this today. Um, okay, let me see here. So let's introduce the panel who we have today, a, a medium-sized panel. We've got all the way from uh, Canada, I think, is Kyle. Kyle, how's it going? Uh, it's going all right. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I would say that the uh, capitalist system is having some, it's having a time, it's having some issues. Um, and that's mm. interesting. Uh, it's going to be a wild ride uh, <laughs> for the next year, I think. Uh, so are you talking like markets, like, are we talking about we're expecting like a September, October fucking disaster crash? Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, everything, Whoa, else, everything too. else on top. It's like, if you take like David Harvey's like rip of Marx's sort of like multi-dimensional conception of the, the human social existence, you could just like put a crisis in every single dimension um yeah we're 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 oh it is it's it's a lot but uh at the moment things are going okay for me i actually finished doing some of my doctoral research uh, like a big section of the content analysis i was doing uh for the last year um this week so that was a big plus so what is your what is your PhD? What's the content of it then? I, I kind of forget. Oh yeah, my PhD is about uh utopian futures. So sort of, you know, in the green room we were talking about how monopolizing the future and collecting rents on it is a power position. <laughs> So uh, it's about that kind of uh, uh, trying to break with the exclusive um, Musk Grimes mafia uh, ownership of the future uh, and how we can use video games to do futuring. Um, so my first paper I'm writing is about uh, is, is looking at utopian games and then i'm like doing content analysis on reactions to those games and then coding it to see like okay well when people talk about utopia in games what do they talk about and uh yeah there's a theoretical framework that goes along with that about sort of process philosophy and utopia um so yeah that's that's my first paper and the 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 PhD itself is a paper-based PhD, so um, it doesn't have like exactly a central thesis, but um, you know that's the kind of area I'm working in right now. I, I must say, I did not know, I never heard of process philosophy. I just looked it up there. Oh, oh Tom, yeah, you got to get in with the process philosophy. It's, oh, yeah. It's the main reason why I was freaking out so much about neoclassical economics last time. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It looks interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's yeah, even, I'm even using analytic philosophy to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Whitehead. Whitehead. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, and then all the way from, we, uh, oh, are you, when are you going back? Are you going back to Holland at all? Yeah, like I will definitely be going back. I'm just not sure if I'll be back in the fall or not yet. Okay. I yeah. might be, maybe. Um, it kind of depends on a lot of different things. Um, but yeah, I'll either be back in the fall or probably yeah. the spring of next year. But yeah, I'll, I'll be back. I'll be back. Um, 
I'll be Bach. Yeah. Um, no, uh, so then we have in Arizona, we've got Esri and Sophie uh, knee deep in the mangroves. How's it going? Yeah, you know, just uh, I guess it is about to get humid here. Humid here. So, first of all, my name is Clive. Yeah, oh my god. Clive. So, write that down. Everyone's Clive. <laughs> Clive. What, a, what a good name Clive is. <laughs> no, it's not. Clive. I, I, but it, it, it's it's an ironically name. good name. Like, it's like, it's like so bad, it's actually a good name. Like, if you were called Clive, it would definitely add spice to your life, wouldn't it? I mean, if if, you know, if a non, if, if like a band or a, a if there was the Clive Corporation, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's, you have to, you're an, a planet named Clive, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's getting to the dimension. Anyway, enough about naming bands, uh, naming uh, planets after Tom's old bands. How are we doing? Uh, uh Yeah. Yeah, ah, sleep deprived. I've been uh, reading a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, Georgie Lukash for Swampside. So that effectively means I've had breakthroughs in cannabis technology in order to. <laughs> um, how- she really has. Like, this is not even a joke. I'm watching it happen in front of me. It is. So in what sense? Like, you just had so much. Oh, and it, well, actually, so. Probably one of the most convenient things you can get are these vape pens. Right. And yeah. they, they have, um, but they used to suck. They used to just kind of give you a headache. But they figured out how to extract the shit, like, properly. And so now they fixed vaping. It's very nice. It's all nice and clean. Um, but I, I have this cute little Hello Kitty bomb. Whoa, whoa. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Yes. They fixed vaping so it doesn't create like massive crystals in your lungs and slowly turn you into a rock. Oh no, no, they still that still happens. But that's I just oh, okay, okay. The that's what it's for. They, they fix the high. Kyle. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, gotcha, we're, on, gotcha. we're on the same element here. Okay, great. Um, but then you know I have this beautiful, nice little, like translucent pink Hello Kitty ice bomb. And I'm sitting there vaping. It's sad. Just sitting there, no, you know, full of ice, looking looking well cleaned and taken care of. And so what do I do? Is that you combine the two elements. You can just activate the vape pen in here, and then you can tolerate Georgie Lukash. Like it's really great. Like it doesn't bother you that the moment that standpoint epistemology is created for the proletariat is, you know, pretty much the moment it's stolen from them because this like creates a decent seal. Like, and you can, if you just press the vape pen down and and hold the button and inhale it, you know, you can ignore the, the depressingly like, like just slavish intro where he's like, so sorry you ever said anything interesting. Anyway. Oh fun. my god, that part, yeah. Oh my god, it's I I I have I understand Lukash more, but the respect definitely took a hit. I'm gonna say that. Like mm, if, Yeah, if, things if, things if, definitely took a turn for the worse in uh Hungary. Yeah. Hungary. What can we say about Hungary? Dear God. Well, I was at a party there a while ago, you know, six six or eight months ago and uh somebody had one of those pens those uh, vape uh you mm-hmm. know hash pens whatever and i i uh i smoked incredible amounts of it and i got zero off it at, at all oh, but that's, uh, that's when, when i was like when I, like i've never actually gotten stoned in my life from from like weed or anything even when everybody else would be rolling around like idiots after eating like cookies and things i would just be completely sober it's very bizarre wow. I don't, it just does not affect me at all, <laughs> unlike other substances. But yeah, it's very weird. Yeah. Legitimately could be genetic. Just, just a pop. Mm. Yeah, it's weird. Never had anything. Never, like, once I puked, oh. but that's probably because I had about 12 pints of Guinness or something, you know? Oh, well, like, okay. that'll do it. Um, well, Emancipation Network meetup. I'll get, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this <laughs> we'll, try, we'll try intravenous THC. Oh, God. What's, what's our 12 steps? steps. What's there our 12 steps. steps? There are steps before that. Next <laughs> time oh. I'm in Amsterdam. Yeah. yeah. That's right. I got a solid chunk of 
that's hand. Like that. Didn't the didn't the jazz, is it the jazz trumpet or didn't he die? Um, what do you call him? He died. Jazz in, trumpet in is that is that just another term for smoking weed? No, 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 no. Chet Baker. <laughs> Wasn't he trying to like? I don't know. Climb into like some drug dealer's apartment and fell off like a six four balcony and landed on his face and killed himself. Oh my God. Chet uh, Baker was a mess. That yeah. sounds wild. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, with a, a lot like <clears throat> sorry, along with a lot of the jazz musicians of his era, heroin. It wasn't a good time. Uh, you know, that's, yeah, no. That that bad bad hangover from the the failed rev. Um, just everybody strung out not healthy yeah yeah he, he got his he got his front teeth broken by somebody in some kind of deal gone wrong and he couldn't play trumpet because he couldn't oh. get the proper aperture for like 10 years so he became essentially nearly like homeless or he was like working i think oh, as, a, as a, like he was a film star and like a jazz like he was like huge and then he ended up i think working in just a petrol station pumping gas for a while and, and all that time he was trying he he trained himself to play the trumpet with no two two no with no front teeth which apparently is supposed to be impossible and after about 10 years of doing it even though he was a heroin addict and practicing all the time as well he managed to get like the sound back pretty good and then he kind of became a jazz musician again holy shit wow so he yeah just, like, it's pretty incredible his lip until yeah. he like recreated the embouchure yeah he had to train mm -hmm. his yeah the front teeth are important apparently don't understand really how, but that's the story. Okay, let's go on. Let's let's hit into this. We are on to chapter five, Michael Mann's two frameworks of class analysis. I'll take the first little bit. This is the main oh, oh this is the main thesis here. Okay. The main thesis is there is a disjuncture between the general uh, does anybody know much about the Michael Mann? I don't really know much about him. Anybody know anything of him? Nah. No. So another one of these sociology guys, I guess. I deeply suspect that Eric Olin Wright chose Michael Mann because it's a way of sort of secretly talking about a one of the Leninist views of, of class. Um, but it's also talking about, it's, it's not like I'm going to go read this, you know, Bordiga and I'm going to go argue with Bordiga. It's just someone that's, you know, making a similar version of one of those arguments in a contemporary sociology context. And specifically those arguments, what do you, what do you mean by the Leninist argument? So, uh, so um, Amadeo Bordiga in one, in one of the pieces he writes on party and class says something that is, I'm not sure if it, this is exactly the point of view that Lenin has, but only because I don't think Lenin would be so honest is that Look, the class, like the actual, like, you know, sociological kind of like fact of the class is nothing. The class organization is the class. Right? Like, just this scattered morass of a bunch of people were supposed to, like, help liberate in their, like, daily lives and who they are. That's nothing. But <laughs> their, you know, their combined capacities, that's the class. That's the real class. So basically, you, you hear this kind of expressed online, like as like a, a a class without like a political organization isn't really a class. Or often you'll hear like, there is no proletariat that exists unless there is a class actor. Yeah, and th right. this this plugs in well with the one party, one class paradigm that a lot of those Leninists are working with. You know, I mean, because to have that kind of organization, which they imagine is sort of a one-to-one -one map. Um, you know, it means that you have something sociologically real. Um, I mean, this, this, especially the one-to-one -one correspondence is wrong, but even without that obviously wrong thing, in my view, it's obviously wrong in the United States. Um, <laughs> like, and in many other places. But like dispensing with that part and just focusing on, you know, classes are what they can do. That's a more interesting conversation. And it happens to be a conversation with, I guess, uh, someone that, you know, wrote a book that sociologists pay attention to and not just like 
you know, extremely online internet nerds and communist grandpas. It's kind of the thing, like I, I end up disagreeing a lot with Michael Mann, but this is like a way better version of what you hear dipshit Marxists talking about. Like, I, I'm like, I don't know, I'm really sympathetic at first to like the idea of not 100% on board with, but like, I don't know, like the idea that like, about how po important power is in organizational structures, and the kind of four different types of power, which I guess we'll get into, but I sort of dig it, and then I stop digging it as much. <laughs> okay. Um, right. Uh, Kyle, yeah, I would also just say, like, uh, you know, given what we read in Revolutionary Strategy, it's like that thing of mm -hmm. even if even if you have uh, a single party representing a class prior to taking power they'll just as a kind of a matter of course fragment once the the class beco like becomes hegemonic um so cuz like yeah it's just like well there's a there's a rationality to bandwagoning together but it doesn't mean that the class the interests of every section of the class are unitary um right and oftentimes there's like just people who aren't represented at all in a party even if they do fragment yeah, like, and you know, I would be more of the opinion that like, you'll never get everybody into uh, one, uh, like, say, the proletariat into one organization that leads them. I think that it's literally there will always be sec sectors, and it's really a power battle within the proletariat itself for for dominance on, on some level. You know, I, 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 you know, I think it's very to. Um, you know the real world is very messy it's not like you know we can just come up with this really good party or organizational form and everybody will go into it it will, it will undoubtedly be messy and have you know power battles and and even if even if your dominant faction of whatever organization wins out after that it'll probably split just like you're talking about and uh, mcnair said yeah, and you can also see this in um, uh, electoral systems with proportional representation, right? Because um, you'll tend to have like a greater split within a class in those systems because there's less of an incentive for bandwagoning. And then the coalitions that they form tend to be like the party in the Marxist sense of like the pre like, you know, uh, S payday style of just sort of like a, a collective movement uh, political actor that has no like really strong institutional basis. Um, well, yeah, you get this agglomeration of all these small disparate parties, you know, or, yeah. or some major ones, but with them too. Like in like in Chile, just did I just released an episode there on Chile, and it's like you know the the uh, the, the popular unity platform. It was like there was about seven or eight parties in the goddamn thing you know mm -hmm. yeah it's like in the belgian it was like a belgian government coalition um <laughs> or a dutch one <laughs> or a dutch one yeah you know there's like nine f parties in the goddamn things ireland's not so bad because we have this very weird thing of we have what are called independents so we have like these people who don't aren't even in a party and they run and there's loads of them there's like about a quarter or maybe in the sixth of the parliament is just made up of these people who just run on their own name, you know, because they're good at like getting, you know, potholes fixed or something. Yeah. It's very yeah. That that's kind wow. of um, a phenomenon that you see in Japan's uh, proportional representation system as well is that you like, you have people who um, like politicians who have like a purely personal power base and they create like a kind of like fake ass party to just be their personal vehicle. Uh, mm. And it's just like them and some other losers and they're the only ones who ever get elected or, or maybe they're just, you know, they're hangers on, but it's, it's really just like an entirely personalistic power base. Yeah. I'm just looking here at the Irish one. There's 23 out of 180. 
you know, it's it's a lot, you know, it's like nearly 15%, you know. So it's a uh, yeah, kind of kind of weird. Um yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's kind of nothing like that. I guess there's some races where you can't join a party and so those are technically like nonpartisan, but they're usually secretly partisan anyway. Like Well, well, yeah, there's some local races where um the like it's yeah it's 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 it's, it's, it's we're told it's like a nonpartisan race, but these individuals are members and supported by either the Republican or Democratic Party. Usually, it's just like you Bernie don't Sanders. see. No, not even like the election itself isn't partisan. So right. you just have oh, a list right, of yeah. six candidates. You you don't know what party they're they're with, but they're with a party. Yeah, what what um what you were describing where someone creates basically like a shell party in their, in the wake of their personal like influence is basically what, you know, Bernie did like for like a very small window after he stopped mm -hmm. being mayor of Burlington and became a, a, a house representative. Um, but like, <laughs> yeah, it la I think, it, I don't know. It didn't last that long. Like, or, or if, from what I understand their independence was, kind of already like not really a thing by that point <laughs> like so it would be so yeah. like like when when i hear about these independents in these countries i'm like oh yeah independence yeah like and i just wonder like how do parties like try to i mean or i mean do they have any incentive to and i imagine they do but you know i don't know um how do parties like interact with these independents? Do they like try to pressure them into well, uh, policies? Like in Ireland, what happens a lot of the times is that like there will be say uh, a constituency in in in, and there will be maybe five seats going to the going to the parliament from this one constituency, and so the major parties might have two or might run three people on a slate, and what happens sometimes is there's somebody who is in the party, and for some internal party reasons, they lose their their, their ticket running for the party in the next election. And so what they do is they say, fuck you to the party. And then they run as an independent, right? Mm -hmm. And then they will win, but they'll usually vote along with their with their previous party. That's, that's I think, the majority of them. And then sometimes it's just single issue, like don't close our hospital candidates and things like that, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. Um, mm. Okay, let's go into this anyway. The main thesis... There is a disjuncture between the general programmatic discussion of class and its theoretical framework and some of the empirical analyses in which he explores specific problems in class analyses. Okay. Man adopts a restrictive understanding of the explanatory relevance of class, seeing class almost exclusively in terms of the ways in which organized collective actors are formed around economic power resources. This is getting to what Esri said there earlier. In this formulation, class is only is only of so, of sociological interest to the extent that classes are constituted constituted as collective actors. In the concrete empirical analysis, on the other hand, he often develops the concept of class in terms of the ways in which the location of individuals within market and work organizations shape their individual interests, experience, and capacities, i.e., more like a structural concept, identifying a set of causal forces that operate on the lives of individuals. Man offers not theoretical argument for integrating, d does not, I presume, uh, offer a theoretical argument for integrating these two conceptualizations. Okay. Um, just that bit there, but can can somebody talk to the, this difference between the structure and the power uh, actor? and what he's getting at there well um it's essentially like in the first conception if you aren't a collective actor uh acting on a rational class interest then you aren't socially real to him but then when he goes and does the empirical analysis, people who do not belong uh, or do not uh, like manifest their class interest exclusively through 
uh, rational deliberation on which collective actor to join and then the deliberation of the collective actor on how to behave um, are in the empirical analysis and they have like you know, dimensions of their lives that are shaped by their class positions and class relations uh, in a way that doesn't make any sense in that first framework. Right. And, right? They, can, like, yeah. and they can, like, they can act in the world with respect to their class, but not through one of these power organizations as a class organization. Yeah. Because you're talking about like, uh, you know, a, a, this structural conception of class, which is that like, you know, there's some kind of structuration process where an individual is given like a disposition towards class and that affects how they behave. Um, and whether they're a member of a collective actor or not, uh, that is like, you know, for itself has no real, uh, uh, there's has no necessary connection to that. So, like, is there a reticence uh, in these sociologists to talk about that leap from class in itself to class for itself? Um, I mean, probably they just don't want to use, like, Hegelian language, but they're totally talking about it. They're talking yeah. about it without talking about it. But he's... Well, like, well, the right point criticism. here, right point that here is that man, man, it's like basically says that well, this whole cluster of stuff doesn't really matter for class. Only you know, only the the power stuff does. But as soon as you recognize someone's power, like organization, and how do you explain that? Well, then you go back to the stuff that he said that he's going to ignore, like right. <laughs> right. What he calls latent class when he does an actual empirical analysis of the middle class in the nineteenth century. All these relations, which man would dismiss as latent class, it's not sociologically real, are the reasons why people, you know, why collective actors form in the first place. So if it's not important, why does it make the thing that's important? Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, who wants to take this one? Ezri, do you want to read this one? Yeah, I got it. So the raw materials of alternative approaches to class analysis. Most theoretical approaches to class analysis embody three clusters of interrelated concepts. Class relations, class location, and class structure. That's cluster one. Cluster two is class structuration and class formation. Cluster three is collective class actors. All three of these clusters constitute, quote, realist conceptions, um, insofar as they attempt to identify real causal processes and their effects. While in principle, there is no inherent need to choose among them, in practice, class analysts tend to center their work on one or another of them. Okay. Um, like, I, 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 must, I must admit, I find it quite difficult to to uh, understand the difference between these, we 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 can we I think we can just go to the first one, the class relations. Let's try the next one. Do you want to keep keep going there, Esri? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, when you have like that many that many things with class, there's like you know six different. You know. It was it was dead ass, just hard to read. I was like, yeah. wait, so it's, there's three things, but there's like seven terms here. I had to read it like a lot. Yeah, yeah, and it's like class relations, class structuration, class like class structuration versus class structure, you know, class formation, class. I just find it, I find it like usually I think I find right very easy to read, you know, clear. Mm -hmm. But I found this section I must I must admit quite confusing. Um same. I think I'm skipping class. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, this is this part was short, all right? Like fair. Um so let's see. So, so for the first cluster, class relations, class locations, class structures. Um, class relations have different definitions. For Weberians, they emphasize the social relations of exchange in markets, locations within class relations, or what Weber calls class situations, are defined by the nature of the assets that people bring to the exchange relations. Marxists, on the other hand, 
define class relations in terms of a more encompassing idea of social relations of production, which include the relations of exchange in the labor market and the relations within production itself. Uh, class location is a micro level concept. It enables us to identify a set of causal processes impinging on the lives of individuals. Class structure is a more macro level concept. It is defined by, it is defined by the set of class relations within any relevant unit of analysis. One can thus speak of the class structure of a firm, of a city, of an economic sector, of a society, etc. And then class relations is the cumulative common term for both micro, macro level concepts. Um, class locations are defined within class relations, sorry, are defined within class, defined within class relations. Class structures are composed of sets of class relations. Um, so okay. basically, I think it's helpful to think of this as like, you have this big, you, you have this like, you have something inside of class relations, and then you have this big web of class relation, relations of class relations, basically. And if you think of a, a specific class relation, and you might have two people, two locations in that specific relation, and then you think about the relationship of that relation to other relations, well, that's the structure. Okay, let's break it down here. Like, let's talk about like, well, let, give us an example here of a class relation then. You know, um, so, you know, Alice works at Bob's factory, you know, like that's like, there's two, there's two um, locations there. There's the, you know, bourgeoisie and the proletariat, right? There's a, you know, Bob, bourgeois Bob and anarchy Alice. <laughs> right like there's like those are your locations like the, the spaces that bob and alice occupy um th those are those micro little seats of of class you know so that's, that's the class location versus yeah. the class relation is there like the, yeah is, is there is the relation between the bourgeoisie like and the mm -hmm. the worker but the class structure then is the relations between uh the 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 bourgeoisie generally and the uh, workers generally is that what class structure is saying versus class relations yeah this is not yeah so that, no that's that's right so how how does the relationship of alice and bob relate to you know the factory down the street that has position a for the worker and position b for you know the, the bourgeois, you know, bourgeois right like, yeah, and there, there's sort of like meso level concepts of like, oh, mm -hmm. what is the class structure of this city, right? You could talk about that. It, it, uh, you, you don't um, have to go from like the individual to the maximal level of uh, structural abstraction. There's yeah, also right. like this this firm city economic sector that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's also in it's, structure. Well, it's it's any. It's any relation between relations if it, in, in these economic terms. Like once there's a relation between two specific people, it's much more concrete than, all right, you know, you have the two factories or whatever. Uh, they might, or they might, it might even be the same firm. You know, what's the relationship between like, uh, you know, Alice's employment at the firm and, you know, uh, Tommy Charlie's uh, employment at the same firm or whatever. Like anytime, you know, it, it can be as small as comparing, you know, one person's relationship with the boss to another person's relationship with the boss. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, yeah. I, I, it's just clear to my head. Yeah. So like, cause class relations is common to both. So it's like both of the small location and the higher mm -hmm. structure. Yeah. So yeah. I, 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 I wish he could. No, no, no. I, I wish. No, he, it's not. It's, and it's not, this isn't explained the best. Yeah, no, the, you know, in terms of clarity, this could have been rewritten, like, because if you focus on class relation, and then you kind of zoom in and then scale out in a more deliberate way, I think, I think it's not so bad that there's three words here, as long as you understand that it's relation is really what we're trying to understand. 
Right. Like, okay. I really could have used one of those fancy like figures that oh, Wright does yeah. sometimes for this. Yeah, totally. Like, you know, have it kind of nested, like you got the big structure and then underneath that you got the relations yeah. and then underneath that you got the locations. That would have really helped me conceptualize this. But 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 class relations are both in my in my, in in the location and the structure as in they're common. Yeah, you could have done some kind of like umbrella. You, you, you could do it. You could do some kind of figure. Like, yeah, we want some uh, network, some node, uh, some node analysis. <laughs> um, not. Okay. Um, right. Let's then. So then we're on to the second lot. Um, uh, do you want to take this one then, uh, 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 um, uh, Sophie? Sure. Class formation and stru structure. Ugh. <laughs> All right, off to a great start. Class formation and structuration. Class relations and the locations they determine do not by themselves define a social group with any real identity or cohesion. People occupying a common location within class relations do share something important in common. They are subject to a common causal component of their life chances, favor, and this justifies treating them as a socialist relevant category but they do not necessarily share a real collective existence. They're not necessarily a real social group with real social boundaries. The ramifications of class are stronger when classes become social groups in this stronger sense. What's interesting reading this, it, it kind of reminded me of like, um, like the early SPD in that like, you know, they just kind of had, or like they're not just the early SPD, but like the like early German workers movement and that they had like just a bunch of workers groups. Like, um, I don't know, let's, let's go bowling. Let's go ride one of those ridiculous 19th century bicycles together or whatever. Like they just had shit they did together. That wasn't even necessarily political and how that helped make a real social group with real social boundaries. And maybe that, maybe that's why we need a communist bowling league. Uh, this is a big subject of enthusiasm um, as part of the uh, sort of neo kautskyist revival with McNair. People started reading this book, The Alternative Culture by Vernon Litke, uh, both at the insistence of uh, Jacobin Head, Bhaskar Sankara. Everyone should read these books. Nice to know we're uh, downstream of all that. Yeah, but like... Even a broke clock is right, you know. We should go bowling. That's fine. I mean, we should go bowling. Bowling is bowling sucks. Let's be honest. <laughs> you know. I thought you would love bowling. You love <laughs> drinking. <laughs> it's just drinking, and it's just drinking, and with, like it's with different shoes. Yeah, so you can throw up in your shoes, and it's fine. <laughs> hey, you just give the throw up shoes back. It's it's fine. It's hard not to get sick when you wear clan shoes and drink a bottle of whiskey, you know. But uh, no. Yeah, I haven't had a you drink. Who drinks whiskey at the bowling alley, Tom? What the fuck? Uh, you know what? I haven't had a drink since I puked bile a few weeks ago. It's done oh, me. Oh, God. God. Yeah, six weeks. I haven't had a drink in six or eight weeks. I don't know how long I'm gonna, now. I'm going to pour one out for Tom. Pour <laughs> one out, I mean, coffee. Yeah. I have like 48 cans of beer sitting downstairs just staring at me as well. And I every time I walk past them, I, I, I feel my stomach churn. Yeah. Man, what were you drinking? I don't even think I drank that much. Like, that's the thing. You oh, know. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like, I say that, but I did have, like, eight or nine pints and, like, six or oh, eight. Tom! But, like, <laughs> but, you know, it was over a long period of time and I had food and things. You know, I was surprised, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. I, I don't drink anymore, really. You know, that's it. Like, so when I go out, I go mad. Uh, <laughs> okay. So this is really, uh, this is this is quite okay. This is, so what, what, what? So define to me here what he means by structuration. I think you should take this, Ezra, because... So structuration is borrowing from Anthony Giddens, the uh, Sir Anthony Giddens, who was knighted for defeating the Marxist in sociological combat. Uh, or whatever. <laughs> I, I don't know, like... Isn't he the guitarist from uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers or whatever? <laughs> yeah, babe. Um, yeah. He's, he's they knighted him. They knighted him. <laughs> <laughs> I never want to feel 
Okay. Um, so he's the brilliant did, sociologist that the British think <laughs> too. He hides his accent um, so well when he sings, you know. Like, yeah, he really sounds like he's from California. Yeah, he's, yeah he, called, he, he think, came up with he came up with both structuration and uh, Californication. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Singular genius, Anthony Giddens. Um, so Anthony Giddens did a bunch of stuff during the eighties, including uh, creating like a non-Marxist theory of history and all this kind of stuff that was, you know, sociologically of interest to Marxists, but also kind of like, fuck you. We don't need you. We don't need you to do all this cool stuff. Um, so incorporating Giddens is, eh, I guess, part of rights intellectual omnivorousness and i would say maturity but perhaps half listenership and the panel here might think of it as cowardice to incorporate um the the cons you know something from an you know the enemy sociologists but um but structuration includes i'm just going to read inter and intragenerational class mobility class patterns of marriage and friendship formation, the degree of class homogeneity of the neighborhoods, the class stratification of schooling in ways that reinforce class boundaries, and the many other processes that render the commonalities of common class situations and locations salient to the people in those locations. Um, so, I mean, on the one hand, we should really kind of kind of shrug, who could argue with that? If you're interested in our interest, understanding class, those things are clearly relevant. Um, part of why right Danes even separate these different clusters is that people will fixate and focus on specifically this to the exclusion of other things. Okay. Um, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's it's more about a nearly a focus. These these are yeah. I suppose that's his general overall point, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like the thing is that by using this kind of like process concept of structuration that allows Giddens to do a non-Marxist theory of like economic social history, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, you know that that's. That's sort of uh, pr maybe process metaphysic rightfully smuggled into like sociology, I think, uh, has, you know, uh, explanatory value, if, even if we don't like where it comes from. Cool. Uh, we can skip the next slide because you basically just read out the next one ahead of me. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. No, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Okay. So let's go on to, okay. Do you want to take, uh, oh, so uh, uh, Sophie, do you want to? Keep going with this one then. I don't ever want to feel okay. <laughs> <clears throat> class formation and structuration. For some class analysts, the decisive problem in class analysis is the formation of classes as groups in this sense. Pierre Bourdieu regards classes that are not constituted as real groups as merely classes on paper suggesting by this metaphor that they are just nominal categories invented by the analyst. Bordeaux emphasizes the need to break with the intellectualist illusion that leads one to consider the theoretical class constructed by the sociologist as a real class, an effective mobilized group, excuse me, an effectively mobilized group. Paul Kingston goes even further, insisting that if Classes are not formed into such bounded groups with, the high, with high levels of internal homogeneity, then classes don't exist. He thus refers to the act United States today as a classless society. I think, I think it's supposed to be just the United States. Yeah. All right. No bits. He thus refers to the United States today as a classless society. That's the, that's the hashtag, at United States. <laughs> yeah. I just got a notification. Babe, you're the United States? No! I am mean, I am part of the United States. You didn't get a notification. You just added the whole United States. Oh, God. The United States only exists because um, Esri represents it. It's true. It's if true. if, it, if, if <laughs> it wasn't there, there would be no United States. It would be a meaningless social concept. 
I, f- I feel like there might be people on the internet that feel this way. <laughs> you were supposed to destroy the bourgeoisie, not join it. That This is when you're in the lobby and you say, I hate you. I say, hey, if you can't beat him. <laughs> okay. Uh, he thus refers to the... <laughs> Do you know how hard this is going to be to edit around Jesus? Sorry. I'm not even the one who... I was about to continue reading. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, it's, all right. Time sensory. Yeah, hold on a second. The United <laughs> States is a classless society. Can we just talk yeah, about Yeah, this? okay. All right. Okay. Can we talk about this? Because, like, oh my God. What the? F- I, no, no, no. Mm. I, I think, because uh, Chomsky also um, does this, like the myth of the classless society. And Chomsky's, of course, what I'm trying to say is good about this. And that the way that America presents itself is as the land of opportunity as equality of opportunity being more or less the end of social class, right? So this isn't, you know, this rings familiar for nauseating reasons for American readers. Right, in America, there, I can't remember who said it, but there's that old adage, you know, there's no such thing. Marxism never took off in America because workers don't think of themselves as oppressed. They think of themselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. Which may have been true in the good old heyday of American ingenuity, but now I mean, is it was it? Yeah, people, <laughs> people see shit like that and just like jerk off, motion, fuck off, like you know. Speak well, for yourself. More, more, yeah. <laughs> more, I think more people. I, you know, I don't even know how to speculate on. I think people are just more cynical about shit. So like. But, but also like the well, it's not, yeah it's not like they're woke they're, they're not like <coughs> Marxists because they don't believe in like hustle culture or something it's just like it's something that we're surrounded with now that's like compared to with our daily lives it's such obvious bullshit like yeah the hustle isn't about getting ahead in life the hustle is about paying your bills and barely getting by so like people who are proud about their hustle are like probably a grifter and it's pretty obvious because the people who actually do hustle are still struggling. They're not, like, getting ahead. But there's also people that are go- are grinding but can't psychologically, like, handle the idea that they're never going to get up. Yeah, sure. Some people are, are fooling themselves more than they're trying to fool others. That's fair. That's, you know, like, it, it's kind of an understandable, like, reservoir of, like, hope for people, and which is kind of one of the problems of class consciousness. There's this queer girl that just reminds me of that uh, she she's super gorgeous. But like when I started following her on Facebook, it was all this like hustle memes and shit like that. And I'm just like, you're being played like. Yeah, but by whom? It's it's so diffuse. She's playing herself. Sort of. She has help. Like. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, I don't. Anyway, that's just a stray thought, whatever. <laughs> in in America, though, as well, you did have this, like, kind of, you know, Europeans went over there and stole mm-hmm. land yeah. and got an actual piece of land versus being, you know, a serf or a peasant with fuck all. Like, you know, there was a yeah. more distribution of resources at a particular time in its history. Yeah, yeah within the white population, you know, for right. example, like, for, you know, nuclear families. Totally. Like there, there's a there is a sense in which if you're part of that in group, it was, you know, more fairly distributed than other, you know, in groups. Like and then capitalism. And radi- I think I think radically more more distributed than say somewhere like Europe at the time as well. You know. When when you take over a different continent and displace all the people there, yes, that's right. what you can do. Like <laughs> How do you take like the slavery out of it? Oh yeah, <laughs> just ignore the yeah. slavery and the genocide. Well, like, that's why people are obsessed with like uh, colonizing other planets because you know it's a fantasy about like, but what if we could just do that again? Do like do it again, but like, oh, I don't know. Like the thing there, that makes anyone to genocide. Yeah, it kind of makes it feels a little different if the planet, if the universe, like appears dead and empty you know like, they'd have to just that's why they're going to bring robots rocks. with them that's why they're going yeah. to bring robots so they can like basically just kill the robots they'll bring the robots with them 
<laughs> get them to run around and then like shoot them and go, yeah. Have, have you seen how Elon treats Tesla workers? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah you know, yeah. It's, yeah. it's like literally the same playbook. It's like, we're going to bring them over and they'll be indentured servants. And then when that doesn't work, we'll figure out some even more oppressive structure of of labor. This is just the plot to Red Faction, the uh, the video game where there's a mm-hmm. communist uprising on Mars. Like, Although to yeah, be fair, like that does have a very long history in science fiction. Yeah, no, no, it was invented by the PlayStation developers of Red Faction. I can't yeah. think of any any celebrated novelists that have done anything similar. This reminds me also of. Uh, that more recent game that was made by the same people who made New Vegas, um, Outer Worlds. Okay. It's like neo feudalism in, in space. But steampunk. It's a also little like, more steampunk. Yeah. Well, what was the, there was a TV program there a while ago. It's just finished. Um, Sci fi one. Um, oh, Christ. The Expanse. Expanse. Yeah. Kind of similar. Yeah. Kind of thing. Um, Anyway, I guess I should eventually finish reading this. Yeah, right? keep going. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't know which version of this sentence we're going to use. I'm just going to read it one more time just to make it easy for you. He thus refers to the United States today as a classless society. Jean Pakulski? Jan Pakulski. Okay. Jan Pakulski. And Malcolm Waters refer to such situations as classless inequality. It's like when we talk about like atomization of the proletariat, except they're like, oh, but that means there's no classes because people are atomized. The better, yeah, I think the better way to talk about this is is the kind of Chomskyan thing, as we mentioned earlier, that like to point out how this is actually terrible. You'd even have to believe that class is only a relevant social category when it's organized as a collective actor to see that the proletariat acting uh, lacking a collective actor is fucking horrible well there's just a lot of people that clearly would benefit from a redistribution of resources like and it's so intuitively obvious when I don't know if you live in a city and see glittering skyscrapers and people piled up in the street next to them sleeping, it's it's not like a you know, like, no, like, it doesn't take a lot for people yeah. to think like maybe they should get a just a little bit of that, just a little bit at least, yeah, or maybe but, on, on a bad day, ah, this whole fucking thing should go to hell, yeah, I don't know what that means, but it's like, fuck this. Something's clearly wrong. It, it, and it, this is something that's intuitive to the framers, a debate going all the way back to the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists. Something that really, as a, as a young, young egg, that really uh, stuck with me is reading how the Federalists were against direct democracy because they knew it would lead to redistribution of resources. Yeah, class struggle. Right. Anyway. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, like, the kind of, the kind of inequality in the United States today, it would maybe too conspiratorial to think of it as engineered, it gives the framers too much power, but, like, the Federalist does lay the blueprint for dispersing (laughs) class power so that you can, you can maintain a proletariat without having to face the proletariat, like, um... So classless in it. and disturbingly, it seems almost like the rest of the world. Maybe because this is you know capital. This maybe this is like capitalism's like one of their like most difficult forms to deal with or something because it. Unfortunately, this is a talking point of the of the European far right, but a stopped clock and horseshoes here, um, is that you know the American style of trying to disintegrate the proletariat in that way. That's a popular strategy that has spread among the world bourgeoisie. <laughs> like not everyone can really pull it off because some places have, you know, too much, too many roots or whatever, or uh, I, I don't know why, maybe they just can't politically, you know, outflank this or that. 
But um, one person involved in that uh, effort, Anthony Giddens. <laughs> yeah, I, I would imagine he is. How is he involved? I don't ever want to. Oh, you use like the structuration theory to basically like argue that class doesn't mean anything anymore. And then uh, you uh, like break all the social differences down into such fine grain nuances that uh, it's like everything becomes a shade of gray. Mm, right. There's like a famous British uh, philosopher guy, is it AJ Grayling, I think? And he makes this sick argument. I had a, like a lib friend of mine saying, oh, yeah. Classes don't exist anymore. Working class doesn't exist, man. And if you really yeah. hit hit strength, if you really just think about it, you know, yeah. you're just like all people. <laughs> I, I'm not Pretty high cool. enough to do that. No, <laughs> and I never will be. Meeting people like that out in the wild is like infuriating. Anyway, the have you ever realized that we're all the same species? I'm sorry. Did you just stop. <laughs> Speak for yourself. I'm a cat girl. The central idea here is that one can identify an indeterminate number of attributes as characterizing the social location of a person, and there is no reason to give special importance to any of them unless they are crystallized into real social groups. It is, it is only this. Uh, it is only this that establishes the realism of the hypothesized real causal process identified with class relations. That, that last sentence has broken my brain. What's it saying? That's a direct quote, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't ever want to read the central idea. <laughs> The what central, I read today. The central idea here is that one can identify an indeterminate number of attributes That's as fine. characterizing the social location, and there's and there is no reason to give special importance to any of them, right? And then it is only this that establishes the realism of the hypothesized real causal processes. Okay, so this should just be part of the previous bullet, basically. Oh, oh, the conclusion. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're separated by semicolon in the, okay. in the text, and it makes it makes perfect sense. Um, right. So uh, I think we're on to class actors. Is the last uh, one? If I if I'm to understand this properly, it's essentially that like the reality principle here is that this mm. is a class and this is not a class. Right. Like. Like arbitrary individual uh, attributes, uh, yeah. not a class. Uh, collective actors, that's a class. Yeah, it's uh, it's that, those it's, are real, and the reality principle is you got to be this thing and not the other thing. Yeah, it's it's an interesting sort of empiricism about like social actors or something. Or it's 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 weird, like. It's an appeal at once to empiricism, but also to like a collective actor, which I, I just don't associate collective, like the positing of collective actors with empiricism, but I guess that's a pretty high bar to clear, right? So if there's an obvious class actor in your life, you'll know about it. Like, like um, Yeah, and then, then you get somebody like Bruno Latour, who'll be like, no, the collective actors are meaningless. It's only the arbitrary <laughs> attributes of individuals that are real. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it says here that the real causal processes, but for me, surely the real causal process is the process of jumping from <laughs> the individual to the class action. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. That, like, that's a thing. And I think that's kind of. Wright's whole point is that like these economic relations are what drives the formation of class actors in the first place. A thing that's important to you is caused by the thing that's not real to you. Yeah. Like, I'm not necessarily like any kind of hard methodological individualist. I think there's plenty of things that can be understood in aggregate that you don't have to necessarily break down in order to observe and say anything meaningful about. However, if it is a social process at some point, there are individuals doing it, like and like thinking shit while doing it. You might not be able to map every little bit of that, but like, well, right. Like, I don't agree <laughs> with methodological individualism, yeah. but like, 
I, I think some Marxists who are just like so, who just bristle so much at that, it's like, well, what do you think, who do you think makes up groups? Right. Yeah. <laughs> What right. are you're not being dialectical enough? Right. So, no, no, but real causal process here is like the, the thing that's driving me nuts is that like, you know, <laughs> like individuals and their motivations doing stuff, not real causal process. You know what I mean? Like um big like symbolic like class actor wielding some sort of like obvious interest, although, you know, it's very sympathetic to this being a big causal thing in general, just seems like, it just seems to be cutting off and maybe just bracketing off a lot of the interesting, like, parts of social class. It does seem like in this environment that it's trying to necessarily take the teeth out of any idea of, like, proletarian class interest, like, just to be a little like suspicious and, you know, just for, for a moment, I think it's okay to put that hat on too. Like, yeah. Cause I mean, the main, the main point of positing this for like a lot of these sociologists is to say, Oh, we don't have that in America. Yeah. So what you're saying is that Bordigas and these conservative sociologists are basically the same. <laughs> I didn't say that. I just said they both. I'm saying it. They just both like <laughs> to ignore the same thing as long as it doesn't take the right form. <laughs> I'm saying even it. Though, even if they go on about form and content or whatever, right? Like, I'm I'm sorry, sweaty, but you uh, you're you're conservative now. Get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> who 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 are you calling sweaty exactly here now? <laughs> the bordegas in my head that I'm arguing against. Okay. Fair. okay. I thought you were calling Esri sweaty. I was like, that's not nice, Sophia. No, it's pretty temp. It's like, the, we have a nice AC. It's working. It's working Although it is Arizona, so I was going, hmm, maybe it is. <laughs> Those mangroves. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The dank mangroves. <laughs> How yeah. many times can I bring up that really shit joke? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to keep going. I, it until it, it, you got to drive yeah. it into the ground so it comes back through the other side. It's that that's possible. it. Yes. Although I might have done that a number of times already. Um, okay, Kyle, how do you feel about taking this last group then, the class actors? Sounds good. Uh, classes can be formed into relatively coherent social groups without there being any collective organizations acting strategically on behalf of those groups. In some historical contexts, such organized collective actors don't exist because of repression. In others, a variety of countervailing processes, ethnic, racial, linguistic, national, and religious divisions, etc., can obstruct the formation of organizations of collective class action. The explanatory relevance of class, some theorists argue, hinges on the extent to which class-based quote-unquote power actors emerge and confront each other in the various sites in which social structures are produced and transformed. Marx's famous assertion that history is the history of class struggle is the most extreme form of this argument. In this formulation, a fundamental part of explanation of classes as collective actors whose struggles have the effect of transforming social structures. Is that a complete sentence? It's not a complete sentence. Um, okay. Sorry, uh, uh, I'll have to look up the sentence we came from, but keep going, read the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but even if one rejects this, a very strong proposition about the transhistorical importance of collective class actors, it is still possible to see the formation of class actors contesting for power as the central axis of class analysis. Yeah, so maybe a bunch of the last yeah, sorry, I, smattering I, of comments we, uh, is probably better directed at this section with regarding to, uh, you know, class actors, let's say. Sorry, I, I actually left out a line in that, but that's why it doesn't make sense, Kyle. Let me just type it in, and maybe we'll read it again when I get it typed in. All right, that sounds um, good. Yeah, okay. just give me a second. I'll mic myself. If, me, if you want to talk about the general stuff there, fire ahead, somebody. And okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, just, I was saying that uh, probably a bunch of the stuff we, that we had just said is it probably belongs to this section. Like, <laughs> In terms of the sort of like, but what about... When we, when we, uh, sw sorry, sweaty, and, and all of that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then I guess, um, 
uh, you know, this this point about the history of class, uh, history is the history of class struggle is sort of like a lot of what preoccupied history departments mm. in uh, the mid 20th century of like Marxists trying to find collective class actors and then other non-Marxist historians trying to disprove their existence. Um, yeah. Yeah, see, this is the role of critical theory. You know, you're in the middle of thinking of why someone would choose a theory. And then, you you know, while turning over what, you know, might be true or might be a good idea for trying to analyze this objective thing, you then go, yeah, I mean, if you if you assume that, then there's no, there's no real basis for hope in this direction. Hmm. You know, like... Yeah. Because that's always the counter argument I would give to anyone, any Marxist at least, with this, you know, type of uh, this thing is mainly an argument from bad consequences. Well, I mean, if that's true, then you know, what are we even doing? What are, what are Marx even doing? If they're not like you know, clarifying the class interests of the proletariat, more accurately, like by trying to formulate it in a self-serving way, like gum it up really hard, and you know, get people thinking about what it actually might be. I guess mm. you know, maybe, maybe the histor historical role of Marx is really, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, you know, how do you, cause I don't know when I think of, you know, there is no working class or something. Um, I, I do think of the debates around communization and the more sophisticated debates that really try to emphasize the existence of the proletariat and, the way it engages in collective struggle without a class actor. Like, and that's mm -hmm. some of the, like the dankest, coolest like shit that, you know, I think Marxist theory has to offer in the 20th, uh, 21st century. Like, is, is that like, it's just, you know, the idea that there is any, like any reaching towards that collectivity at all that exists instead of just hanging up your head, admitting defeat, you know, like, What's well, really fascinating about that stuff too is that like when they take that line even further and say, okay, like the proletariat exists without a class actor and, you know, thinking about struggle and then tuning that line of thought of, well, what if we did have a class actor and it was something like workers' councils or whatever. I don't think they use the term workers' councils, but they talk about like, the need for like some kind of non leninist organization and end up sounding more like good old fashioned left comms, you know? They have a more diffuse notion of the party than like uh, good old fashioned left comms, but yeah, like. Yeah, probably more akin to councilists, but although I don't even know if they would necessarily agree with that. Communization comes from a, like a critique of, of people that get obsessed with councils themselves as the highest like revealed form or something. Mm. Um, anyway. Fair enough. I don't even want to appeal but, you know, to your class today. You know, importantly, class interest, um, I don't know, can exist without something acting on its behalf. And sometimes it's, only, I don't know, like sometimes is made very visible by something acting against its interest. <laughs> like, uh, it's so obvious if you ever yeah. expect time with like management you yeah know? like the things they get spooked about despite <laughs> they're not being a collective actor on the other side uh, you know yeah it, well that it, it is a little heartening right how fearful authority figures can be of the emergent process because you know there's no obvious class actor on the working class side but they're afraid one's going to pop up out of nowhere. And without their fear, it looks like a very stupid thing to like put stock in. It's, um, it, it's, it, I've experienced this firsthand. It was incredible. So I worked at Target when I was about like 17, 18. And um, this is like towards the end of the Bush era. And there's these couple of like libertarian bro bros who were defensive of, um, of Bush. And they would often bring up politics and that was like this little anarcho lib and so i would always be debating them but they were the, always the ones bringing it up 
But because I kind of signaled my left-leaning politics, me and this, like, absolute, like, cute Stacy girl ended up being sat down and forced to watch this, like, anti-union propaganda. And this was before the kind of resurgence of, like, the albeit limited union activity and, like, labor activity we see lately. This was well before anything like that was going on. And I was just kind of like, what? And then me and this girl just ended up talking about our sympathies with social democracy anyway. <laughs> it was so bizarre. But, like, neither of us were, like, trying to organize a union. Like, we, did, we were fucking kids. We didn't know how to do that. But, you know, you were shown a propaganda film at work. And you thought somewhere in the back of your head it said, a working class hero is something to be. Yeah. <laughs> It's kind of wild. Like, I don't know, like, if you could do that in Europe. I just don't even know if you can show an anti-union thing. I've never really heard. It should be happening. illegal. I think it's probably illegal in Ireland. Or, I mean, just generally in Europe. I kind of, it it's kind be. of shocking to, to get that at work in America, you know. Mm -hmm. America is shocking, Tom. I don't know if you knew that about us. I don't know if that's true, though. They also do that shit in Canada, of course. Do they? Yeah. Yeah. I find it, maybe they do like hear about it. I, I've never heard of it. I've never met somebody who, who told me about it. It's kind of, yeah. No, it's yeah. fairly common in like big, bo you know, what we call big box stores. Um, the irony is they, if it wasn't for this chud, and here's the funny part too, those conservative chuds at work, they'd often, because um, one of our managers was gay, they'd often like run afoul of management even even though that they were defending it's one of those weird ways in which like people's personal lives and their like you know i guess what we would call class location come into conflict like you know the the guys who wanted to duck sick duck sick <laughs> suck dick uh, <laughs> for their bosses duck were, sick <laughs> i want duck sick for my bosses <laughs> that's a charlie chaplin film yeah that's yeah. right yeah marx brothers yeah. Hey. Anyway, it was just a, <coughs> I don't know. This all, this whole thing reminded me of that. Anyway, you're saying something phallic about uh, libertarians sucking up their bosses. Oh yeah, they, they would run afoul of their you know. Foul, a foul. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> Traductin. Kyle, can you read that last sentence and I'll re-edit it in when because I fix it. Oh uh, yeah, of course. Since you'll be heavily editing this section anyway. In this formulation, a fundamental part of the overall trajectory of human history is the formation of classes as collective actors whose struggles have the effect of transforming social structures. But even if one rejects this very strong proposition about the trans-historical importance of collective class actors, it is still possible to see the formation of class actors contesting for power as the central axis of class analysis. Okay, cool. Right, uh, we're going to the next bit. How are we doing for time here today? We we, we do a let, let's see how many. What, let me have a look and see how many we do. Because uh, I don't want to go on too long today. I've got twenty. I go hard out in about half an hour. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Let me just see how many slides here we. we go. Oh, we'll just we'll just keep going then for a while. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll do this one. Okay. So. Uh, now we're on to Michael Mann's general approach to his class analysis. Organizational materialism, that's the name of it. Okay, so man takes a fairly extreme position within the spectrum of possible approaches to class analysis. In his view, class analysis should be almost entirely concerned with the formation of classes as collective power actors. To understand this view, we need to first outline man's general approach, excuse me, general approach to the study of social structure and social change, what he terms organizational materialism. This consists of a conceptual menu for the study of power and his foundational proposition about power and society. Okay, let's have a look at this conceptual menu. So man's framework of the study of power involves two clusters of concepts. One, a typology of substantive sources, sources of social power. That is a hard one to say. Substantive sources of so Substantive source, <laughs> substantive sources of social power. Okay. It's like a vocal warm up. 
Uh, sea cells, sea cells. Fuck. So Sam's the sources of social power. So Sam's the sources of social power. The seashore, sea cells. She sells seashells down by the seashore. And the seashells, the seashells. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, one ideological power. Two economic power. Three military power. And finally, four political power. These four power sources are not like billiard balls, which follow their own trajectory, changing direction as they hit each other. They entwine with their interactions, changing one another, uh, one another's inner shapes, as well as their outward trajectories. Okay, and two, uh, so the second concept then we have is an inventory of forms of variation of the organizations that deploy these sources of power. These forms linked to these sources, <laughs> these forms linked to these sources, to these sources of social power are expressed as dichotomies, collective versus distributional power, extensive versus intensive power, and authoritative versus diffused power. So I, I like the idea of thinking of this as a menu, right? Like I just imagine I'm going to a drive through, you know. Welcome to substantive social powers, social power, how may I take your order? Yeah, I'll have uh, I'll have uh, the number one ideological power with a side of political power. Does the military power come with political power? Uh, I'm sorry, that special is over. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, it's, it's after eleven o'clock. We're not doing breakfast. Um, this, I, like I don't like this. This, this is the thing that I I, I, I kind of I, I really didn't like in it. Uh, where it doesn't kind of talk about what is the primacy, you know, of so like the Marxist concept of economic power is the you know drives the these other the, these other things. It's the it's the motor of these other types of power, and uh, like this idea of how they intertwine and they they how they interact, change one another. I, I feel that it misses like the core idea of like you know the mode of production driving the superstructure. Even from a less deterministic Marxist point of view, these are all categories that probably have significant intersections, like, like you know, this right. military like, power and political power, economic power and political power, ideological power, like political power, economic power. Target showing you an anti-union video is, you know, how many of these does that fall into? Like. Right. It yeah. looks. I think it's like economic power with a side of ideological power. It's a number two. It, but like anti-union, like as as far as like liberalism becoming totalitarian and the way that the Frankfurt School kind of like lays it out, it doesn't get much better than anti-union propaganda. Like at your job, like yeah, yeah, it's fucking weird. Um, I mean, I I, I do agree with Tom's criticism ultimately like to me these things are all interdependent and it's not as is like the more like kind of vulgar Marxist formation of like everything is about the bourgeoisie and blah 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 like even if you don't buy into that like this like how do I say this like it's just the dominant overall dominant thing is the economic basis. You know, not to say that the ideological and the military and the political power can't interact back on the economic power and change it and everything, but the overall driving major force is that. And these are, you know, if you were to write the maths equation, it would be the highest, you know, most Im impactful thing if we we're going to talk about power would come out of economy, you know even though the others can have like second order, third order effects back onto the economic power. Like that's just the well, way I understand it. And I don't understand, I'm not talking about it in a crude way, like, you know, like economy no. drives everything, but just overall from a systemic, you know, if we're to describe this, to structure the system, like that's why I, you know, that's why I don't like this. I I, I feel like, uh, you know, I've said it before, I won't say it again. Well, when I was thinking about my problem with it, I, the, the only, the best way that, the thing that came to mind was like, okay, well, what if there was, what if one of these besides the economic power became super important? Like, let's say there is a military coup, right? Um, the rest of these, you know, social power categories would be 
in service of maintaining that cl class of military brass that took over society and it would serve the interests of that class of people and it would shift the economic power right but to the extent that like the economic structure of the of the society was did, uh you know badly affected by this new military power that had maintained that got power in the coup say to the fact that it was detrimental to the economy the military would find it difficult to maintain their their hold on power yeah i mean i think Kind of like in terms of like if you, you want to take like a really extreme example, right? You could look at like the Mongol Empire. It's like the Mongols were in a backwater. Their economic production in terms uh, in absolute terms was minimal. Um, but because of a change in ideological power and political power, uh, and they were able to actualize military power and conquer a very sizable portion of the world. Mm -hmm. But then if you look into, well, why were they able to do that? There is an economic basis to that in their way of life and the military affordances it gave them. Um, it's not like they were just good at fighting. The way they fought was in like intimately connected to their economic way of life. Um, and and so I think that you know you can kind of get to this like economic foundation for any one of these things, even if the e the economic dimension is not really the obviously active dimension, because that's usually the case, right? Like when you have um, a group that takes power without a like you know uh strong ideological and political conception of themselves uh or you know some military basis they're usually not able to do that um and it, it's really that like crystallization of the group as the group and uh having this like huge esprit de corps and being able to you know affect social reality in a big way that is the the big obvious thing uh and then of course, behind that, there is an economic base that makes it 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 uh, possible, and it's usually tied up with those other forms that you see. Um, like you, you don't get like a political form that is utterly divorced from the economic basis that it, it has. Yeah, like uh, something that's unique about modern society is this like a concept of the economic that's hugely divorced from the political, like, you know, that might've had some independent existence in history, but conceptually speaking, you know, those things are pretty tied up and I don't know, you can even avoid any categorical, like, all right, we're going to just assume these categories are real, even though we're just carving up reality. Um, you can avoid a categorical like claim of always everything uh, being determined by economic power. Like a stupid example is, you know, why is there nine candles on the menorah? Like instead of, you know, 11 or, you know, seven, like, but like a, lo a lot of things in history have weird contingencies that aren't obviously settled by the types of causality of economics in all of its power, you know, um, can emanate. There are limits, like oh, there's but, limits to what, you know, sanctions can um, achieve with uh, Russia's invasion, for instance, like. Well, I think part of the problem with this typology is that it's not simply economic that is the, kind of dominant um, form of power, but it's, it's, it's class relations. And I think like that isn't captured by simply saying economic, it's captured by some kind of, in, the, 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 the real truth is in a version of how these intertwine. Like in that, you know, military coup version, like, yeah, they'll lose popular support if they can't provide economically for the people that they govern, but 
more than that, like the power structure works in service to this new military class that's emerged. That's the main thing in that in that society. Um, but yeah, like it's, you know, this is something that Marx brings up in, I think it's like Capital Volume 1, Chapter 1, right? Where he talks about how like, this idea of ec economic power as determinative is something that only could arise in capitalist society because of the uh, the advent of um, market crises, where there is no there's no uh, there's no one clearly in charge, but this economic thing is reshaping the world in big and chaotic ways. Um, and then from that, you can kind of go back and be like, oh, yeah, like, you know, even if there is a military coup, this person gets in power, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, if you look at feudal society, there is an economic process that was undermining the power of the nobility over the long term, uh, that kind of argument. Right. And um so, so what do we make of these, the second section, second part here of the uh, forms of variations of the organizations, collective versus distributional, extensive versus intensive, authoritative versus diffused power? What do people make of this? I feel like these, this wasn't explained well. In the it book. wasn't explained at all. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah not really. No. So and, I hate it. Yeah, it okay. seems very weird not, he would actually bother putting it in there if he doesn't even literally give you a description of what they are. Yeah, it's like I can guess at what these mean, but I can't really give a strong opinion about it because it's like it's it's just the, those like the words that are here in the slide are the words that were on the page, and there's nothing more to it than that. It makes so me what, think of like a character creator in like a Bethesda RPG game. Like you know, you slide over to the authoritative slider to make your character more authoritative, and if you want to be more diffuse. Well, yeah. So I mean, I don't know. Maybe we should just guess like. Because I think like collective versus distributional, that is sort of, that's like how centralized like um, class power would be or um, extensive versus intensive, extensive meaning like if it means what it means elsewhere, you know, how much of the class does it have in it versus, you know, is it, is it like a vanguard party with an extremely high demand or is it like uh, you know the DSA, where it's, it's extremely like low, <laughs> low commitment, um, you know, like or low kind of social power or something in terms of intensive, authoritative versus diffused. How hierarchical of an organization is it? Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like, you, the first and the third, right? The first and the third seem to be kind of overlapping there. They all seem to be overlapping, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the 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 second one has like uh, has something potentially interesting in terms of external limits and internal limits, but, but other than that, yeah, I'm not really sure why it's here. Come up again, really? I, yeah, I don't know why it's here. I, I really again, I I kind of really don't think he's interested in Michael Mann. That's why I think he doesn't explain it. I think he's interested in like the he's interested in the class like the class actor kind of specific um focus like sociology and why he thinks that's insufficient and he's also interested in the concept of like segmentation um which he goes into in the next section but yeah i i don't know why he just sort of lists it and moves on um yeah come on oh. come on right and his editors okay might, uh, might be his editors we're yeah we're looking at right we we got three. Uh, we got three uh, slides on the, on this section here. We'll do these and we'll wrap up. Um, Esri, how do you feel about taking uh, this one? Feeling great. So, power organizations determine the structure and transformation of society. The structure of society is at its core determined not by culture or values, nor by the rational choices of individuals acting as individuals, nor by the property relations within which people work but by power organizations. Such organizations exercise power through their ability to shape and control values and beliefs, create the parameters in which individuals make choices, and to enforce specific patterns of property relations. 
It is power organizations as such that are the fundamental determination of social structure in society. So when he says social structure there, like, what do we think of that? Like, is power organization not a social structure? I mean, isn't it a bit of like a tautology because he could find the only things that are real as organizations and then saying that power organizations are the fundamental mm -hmm. determinants of social structure, which is composed entirely of organizations. Right. It, yeah, it's more of an axiom than it is. It's like an argument. Um, so it's, it's sort of like, well, I mean, if you think the only thing that's real are these organizations, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Like, well, like the, I last, mean, the last section, the last sentence there is not so much an axiom, but a a, a, a deduction of the axiom. Go on. Well, is it not saying that the, like he says, uh, like, don't you think that matter are power organizations and then it's, but then power organizations determine social structure, yet they are a type of social, or they're, they're a type, they're a subset of social structure. I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess the other reason the other like reasoning here is that like all the other all the other stuff that right is interested in maybe is determined by the power organizations or, or fundamentally determined in the same way that we were making fundamentally determinative is uh, causal arguments for economics and all of these different examples with the mongols and such like you know man, I guess, ultimately thinks the fundamental determinant of social structure are these class power organizations, which, you know, one can appreciate this when you're looking at the German constitution and, you know, however empty their, you know, corporatist like labor puts a rubber stamp on legislation check is it's, it is built into the constitution. And the last time I checked, there was no such role for organized labor in the United States. No. Um, now, the question is, is this really like the fundamental determinant of structure? You know, pro probably not, because if, you know, you no. ask people up about the German economy versus, yeah, even some places in Europe or, you know, the world that don't have a, like, as much of a, you know, maybe labor didn't have as much of a seat at the table in writing the constitution. Some workers are, you know, some sectors of the working class in different countries are better off than that some are in Germany, like in terms of collective actor, <laughs> like, so yeah, I, I don't think, I think this is a, a sort of, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think Wright gets into why this is a frustrating analysis later. Yeah. yeah totally. I, well, I, 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 well, I just, I just think the key thing here is that like, imagine a power organization that is in a double bind or a similarly confounding um, uh, set of decisions it can make or, or, or action potentials it can have. Um, well, what's determining that? Is it just the other organizations? I don't think so. No. Well, right. perhaps, it'll, be, it'll be material perhaps, reality, won't it? But yeah. perhaps the, the power organizations, you know, constructed the the social like the social structure as such, you know, as I guess man's like man in the same way that we were arguing that the what why what you know, why did the Mongols invade all this? And that's fundamentally economic. Man believes this about social structure. Maybe not, you know. Does no no? There's no rule. There's no room for you know. I guess geologic, like. This reminds me of like the people who are like, the president set the the price of gas too high. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so that's expensive. Because the uh, president, yeah, Biden did it all on his yeah. own. Well, how, how, let's. There's a smarter one for that, right? Uh, OPEC did it. 
like or or something like you yeah can but have, you can have that view of not history. borne out by evidence yeah. no, no, no no but like this is, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is more this is but that that's still like a smarter version and you can you can understand why people will look at like the head of a cartel and be like uh, this is their fault as opposed to diffuse emergent patterns which are kind of harder to sense in a causal way so you're the word dialectics is is a thing like so, so you're are you telling me that the uh, school shooters then weren't actually done under orders at nra is this what you're telling me look all, all i'm saying is that they they could have somehow you know in the air did the will of the nra without the nra telling them no I mean, it's all of that. I mean i don't know actually but probably they, they, they suck at what they do. They're not really good at actually defending gun rights, by the way. Um, yeah, they just get Republicans elected. Yeah, that's basically all that it takes us for. One small thing I wanted to add to those that like, as, as like a lefty person who has absolutely no power, there is a way in which this does, this theory does kind of appeal to me. I don't actually think it's true, but like lacking power, I'm like, yeah, we need social organizations to assert our power. Anyway, well, yeah, well, like I, I, I certainly would say that social organizations have a preponderance of power, but I wouldn't say they're determinative of the structure exclusively. <laughs> like social organizations can really push things in a direction, uh, but uh, yeah, the, this is they're just you know as as uh, uh, Wright said here, like it's it's an extreme assertion of of a plausible thesis, right? Right. Yeah. So, yeah, totally. Right, Ezri, keep going. Oh, sorry, Sophie, didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, I just hiccuped. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let her finish her hiccup. Okay. Um, do you want to go? Oh, I'm, I'm reading? Okay. Uh, power organizations determined that... Oh, we already read that. Man does not provide an extended me meta-theoretical defense of his view. He believes that the empirical insights of his historical research provide the best defense of this model. Man's approach is a variety of what might be termed an agency-centered framework of social analysis. The central idea is that people act to achieve goals by develop by central idea is that people act to achieve goals by deploying various kinds of capabilities. They can do this as individuals interacting strategically with other individuals or through their involvement in collective organizations. The creation, reproduction, and transformation of social structure is the result of such strategies. It is the collective organizational form of pursuing goals through the use of power rather than simply the interactions of individuals within social relations that is decisive for explaining social structures and social change. Organizations are able to much more effectively, sorry, organizations are able to much more effectively, mobile. this is a weird sentence. Just say mobile. Sorry, there's, there's too many, there's two. one, there's one, one, two, too many. <laughs> so just drop one of them. Yeah. Okay. Organizations are able to much more effectively mobilize resources of all sorts in pursuit of goals than our individuals. They therefore have a much greater potential impact on the reproduction and transformation of social institutions. That right there, that right there is when I completely was done with man's theory. Because when I read this, I thought, you know, the, the idea that organizations are able to much more effectively mobilize resources of all sorts, I immediately realized, oh, man's never been in a leftist organization before. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, organizations are somehow less than the sum of their parts. <laughs> yeah. In leftist organizations, it is true. Like yes. we subtract from each other and divide until we crumble. Well, that's that's not always been true, but yeah, just true. But like you know, <laughs> that is it's funny. not always true, but often. Yeah, 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 definitely. At the moment, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's undeniably also, true of every single radical left organization probably in the world. <laughs> is that yeah. an exaggeration? 
Not much. Mm-hmm. That's why there's like a bunch. Of, there's 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 a whole layer of like burnt out internet lefties. Some of them probably were always looking to make their move and cash in, but a lot of people probably approached the left with good intentions and got turned away being more conservative than they might otherwise have been. So not not crazy to me. Like like uh so I don't know. So like, we're, we're talking about, we're supposed to be talking about organizations that are, uh, that are class organizations. And I guess a, a class conscious organizations. So maybe the most craven of the Leninists that realize they want to create a new ruling class. Um, <laughs> maybe class conscious, uh, you know, middle class people i suppose but you know <laughs> most Mar- marxists like to flatter themselves but they're not doing that so they get confused so i guess maybe that goes some way towards why these organizations are so dysfunctional and um, when he says man does not provide an extended meta theoretical defense what when he says meta theoretical here what is he talking about what almost... is the that explains the theory so, yeah sorry. Say that again, sorry, Kyle. What is the theory that explains the theory, right? Like, what what justifies the argument that, uh, you know, power organizations are the determinants of social structure? Yeah. Cool. Why this theory rather than another? Right. Isn't this body of evidence also consistent with other theories? Cool. So this is um yeah. So we go to the last slide because we've kind of talked about. Uh, like you know it's this i you know the, the general critique is like you know power organizations yeah they're important but like they're not all that right yeah, and like you can like get like the burian analysis of organizations to see like why they're fucked and self-sabotaging and actually do not uh they, they do not act as a power multiplier for their members Right, to keep on, keep on uh, <laughs> going into defecation mode. <laughs> I really like that part of uh, beer where he talks about like what is it like fourteen different modes of behavior that they've analyzed and like and you know we can look at leftist organizations as jumping between defecation and like fucking sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Oh, wow, that's uh, it's like. Cu- kind of resonates with the, the Freudian use of excretory as like the purge in- instinct um, and as being related to, you know, like morbid violent like behavior to try to eliminate groups or people like uh, that, that does, that kind of does kind of ring true actually. So. Yeah. I saw, um, uh, what was it? Uh, there's a recent study done in the UK uh, and it said that uh, something like one in ten children in the UK right now is engaging in self harm as a result of uh, the social stresses that uh, have been put on them because of uh, rising cost of living. Uh, oh God! So that's that uh, that per like that violent purging, right? Yeah. Uh, desperate situation. Directed inward. Yeah. 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 Sounds about right. Fucking grim. Yeah, that's a, a, extremely grim. Oh yeah. Um, let's let's focus on something a little more sunshiny, like the, the the power organizations determining the structure and transformation of society. Yes, or as I'd say, of of society. Right. Um, <laughs> you do like the double of. Fucking, you know, I've typed <laughs> I, I typed out these slides. There was twenty six of them. I think I did it in one day. It fucking. It, it absolutely broke my brain trying to do it. It's so boring. Um, okay, uh, Kyle, do you want to take this last one before we drop, before we I, exit? I, I, I oh, wanna, I wanna, I wanna Esri, one. Esri, take it. One. Fire. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Go for um, it. Oh, we don't, do we get to talk about segments today? No, no segments. All right. That was the one thing I thought was cool in this chapter. Well, anyway. <clears throat> um, power organizations determine the structure and transformation of society. Um, oh, this okay the struggle to control ideological economic military and political power organizations provides the central drama of social development 
the four power sources offer distinct, potentially powerful organization, organizational means to humans pursuing their goals. Man's general framework is similar to that of rational choice theory. People have goals and deploy resources strategically to accomplish them. However, he rejects the, individual, the individualistic way of elaborating this idea by insisting that the core actors that matter in shaping the structured properties of society are not individuals as such, but individuals combined into power organizations. These power organizations deploying the four sources of power and varying along the three dichotomies of organization. Uh, organization, no variation. Both explain both the principal structural features within which individuals live their lives and the dynamic processes of large scale trajectories of social change. I think this kind of explains why beyond, you know, never being in a leftist organization, this explains why I think man kind of misses the point a little bit as far as what I was saying earlier about organizations don't always marshal resources in a more efficient way. Um, if you look at how individuals behave within these collective organizations, you might see those sort of self-destructive purging behaviors, excretory. You could still argue that man would still be right when those groups aren't dysfunctional. Like, and if man was faced with empirical evidence about this, maybe that's where he would go. Because, like, that's I think he's, he, yeah. Well, I think, I think a collective actor is necessary, like, for the transformation of society. But the way in which he makes it the kind of sole determinant and the way in which he doesn't really, he has this blind spot about the individuals within these collective actors is, I think, where he kind of misses the mark. Well, I think he's not necessarily saying that collective acts, you know, collective organizations uh, necessarily, like, are working to change society in any meaningful way. Right, yeah. No, but that's how, that that is what shapes society. It's not necessarily that they're, it's not like, oh, from collective actors comes communism. No, it's like there's different collective actors right, that could be a mafia. different classes. Yeah. You know, like, but it, it's more the fact that, like, what actually drives, he's saying, the society, you like, dis dysfunctional organizations, he's not making the case that they are doing it, but yeah, when, yeah. They, when they cohere, they are, they are the, the driving force as a part, as opposed to, like, you know, the Marxist conception or other conceptions of what is the driving force. Yeah, these, these types Fair of enough. power clicks. So. He's, he's engaging in the kind of like uh, methodological collectivism that people uh, often accuse uh, Hegelianism and Marxism of. This um, is actually what I, this is actually the other thing I think the right is probably interested in, right? Is that he, he's doing, it's similar to rational choice theory, but it's not individualistic. A lot of, you know, a lot of um, rational choice theorists are explicitly methodologically individualistic, but then they will do something like posit a collective, like national actor, like in an economy or something like, um, and they usually won't provide any argumentation for why that's all right. At least man has this, you know, this sense that this is, a, this specifically is a type of actor that's so socially important that, yeah, you can basically defend a group geist, <laughs> like a group spirit, um, you know, group interest um, using this theory. A purpose unum. Huh? From anyone. From um, anyone. <laughs> it's not a, you know, the a real movie. actor is the is the you know brain meat slurry uh, that uh, constitutes uh, the organization. Yeah, I thought for a second you had said what's the one absolutum absolutum. 
<laughs> if it works, it's out of date. Yeah, that's the, the intro to the dedicate. Or what do you, you call them? The intro of the brain of the firm, or maybe what do you call it when there's a line before a book? Dedication. Oh, it's dedication though. No, it's not. Oh. It's a uh, uh, tagline. Like, no. Oh yeah, there is a specific word for this. That. Yeah. Or a pithy statement at the start of a text. Yeah. Mm. Nope. Smoke that one. Not remember. Okay, so we've basically done half of this. Um, so we'll we will we will get on to the last like ten or twelve slides um, at our next session. Um, so we'll probably just. Sign off. Is there anything else Emily wants to say at this point here before we get on further about the last couple of slides or anything? Or have we talked it out? Um, epigram? Is that what it is, Kyle? Epigram sounds right. A pity saying a remark, expressing an idea in a clever way, amusing. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's that. I guess not. Well, we'll figure it out like in five minutes after we stop recording. So don't worry about it. Yeah. All I have to say is all this talk about man's general framework. What about woman's general framework? You know what I'm saying? Know what I'm saying? I, I hear you. Yeah. Hell I yeah. Think that's, that's that chapter. I haven't read all the book. That's chapter six, isn't it? I uh, oh, but which one? The next one? I'm joking. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, by the way, the word is epigraph. Epigraph. Oh, there epigraph. you go. Specifically, it's when you write the down at the start of something, it's an Very epigraph. Very close. Thank you. Let's see. That's a good word. Uh, so, like, Pedro in the chat says, "My boyfriend said if they invented Nutella flavored vapes, it would destroy Eastern Europe." I saw that. I one. think. Yeah, I think. I'm sorry, Eastern Europe, but I think it'd be worth it. I think Eastern Europe would think it would be worth it too. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's like that's how we're gonna end this war. Is you just you just get the, <laughs> the get the vapes vape out there, yeah. and people will just be vibing, and there won't be any conflict anymore. Yeah. And we'll show yeah. you the fundamental determination of economics by bringing you the vapes. Hey. But we'll show you the fundamental determination of social structure by our social structure flying its planes over your countries and dropping the tele vapes. Yeah, well, uh, vapes as lethal aid. <laughs> that's um, right. Right, so let's say let's say goodbye to everybody in the chat. Alex, Fu, God, Pedro, uh, Mason Kerr, um, hey, Michael Mer Moreno. So uh, re resentless. So we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll reconvene in a few weeks, and uh, we'll keep on trudging, keep on trudging. We'll finish off this chapter next next time, and uh, we will get through this book. Come hell or high water. Never forget, Anthony Akitas is a class enemy. <laughs> <laughs> And a shitty bass player. <laughs> Come on. It's, 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 it's not even Bye. Bye. Bye.